Here on the South Dakota State University campus, we're blessed to have a strong tradition of theater. When I came to SDSU as a freshman in 1966, <laughs> I was a foreign language major with multiple minors, including speech. I was privileged to have worked under Dr. Claire Denton for my stage class, uh, class helping to bring the classic Brigadoon to life or to light really because I worked on the lighting crew. <laughs> Much later in 1987, my eldest daughter Kristen came to SDSU as a communication st studies and theater major and we were once again in the donor, mesmerized by the sets of Camelot, The Wizard of Oz, and Music Man, to name but a few. But in 1991, during the production of The Runner Stumbles, I became aware of a talented young lighting designer rubbing elbows with the greats, Nancy Wheeler, Ray Peterson, and Desi Rival. His name was Corey Shelsta, and he would go on to be, be a, an award-winning designer of lighting, scenery, and sound, not only here at SDSU, but at other regional theaters. If you're a Prairie Repertory Theater aficionado, name one of their productions, and Corey probably did the design. And oh, wasn't counting on having to do this one-handed, just a second. <laughs> and if you're an SDSU theater st uh, student in Professor Shelsta's classes, you'll be exposed to digital technology and virtual reality simulations in the classroom and on the stage. We may initially think of acting when we think of theater, but the plot, the themes and emotions are directed, enhanced by the set design, the lighting, and the sound. As part of our Art Is programs, we are fortunate to have with us today Corey Shelsta, designer and professor of theater at South Dakota State University, who will speak on the topic, Art Is, Filling the Space. Thank you. Um, is, it okay, is it okay if I don't use the mic? Can you all hear me? Okay. It's just, it's going to be a lot easier for me to turn that off. So, okay. This meeting is being sent to a third party. Got it. Uh, so, good morning. How are we all doing? Good. 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 Um, I always start my classes off by, good morning, how are we doing? What do we have coming up this week? Um, we just closed a big production um, of Escape Thingy. Um, I hope some of you had a chance to see that. Coming up at, uh, in, in my world at the Performing Arts Center, we have our spring dance concert right after spring break, and soon after that we'll be opening James and the Giant Peach. Um, and actually this weekend on Thursday and Friday, we have a student doing a, he's produced a, a one-person show that'll be going up on Thursday and Friday in the studio theater. So we've got a lot coming up this week. Little about me, um, I did graduate from SDSU way back, way back when, last millennium. Um, <laughs> did, my, uh, did my grad work in Detroit. I lived in Memphis for a number of years. Um, and uh, we moved back here in the fall of 2000, and I have been teaching here since. Um, my wife works for the Department of Social Services here in Brookings. I have two children, Preston and Ainsley. Um, my children are far more interesting than me, actually. My, my son uh, is in New York City. He did two seasons at the Metropolitan Opera as a stagehand, and now he's the lighting director. If you ever watched uh, the morning news out of um, CNBC, the financial news, or if you ever watched uh, Mad Money with Jim Cramer, uh, that's my son doing the lighting for that. So, um, And my daughter uh, graduated two years ago, and she is a pre-med major in California. Um, and actually, a little, little pitch here for my daughter. Her basketball team just won their conference championship, so they're off to NCAA uh, division play now. And so my wife and I are driving to Abilene, Texas in two days to watch <laughs> basketball. So um, it's pretty cool to, to see that. So she, she, she leads her conference in field goal percentage and blocks and is number four in scoring overall. Oh, so, so yeah, yeah, those of you who know my daughter, she's six five, so she kind of does her thing. And, so yeah, okay. So that's me. My kids are far more interesting than me. Um, thank you so much for for inviting me here. Um, kind of debating a little bit about what to talk about. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process of scenic design, and I'm, I'm not sure all of you kind of know what, if you see, see the end product on stage, I'm going to tell you some, some of what we think about and how we get there. So there's going to be some words first, 
Um, and then we'll get to some pictures, the stuff you, you want to see at the end. So I'll tell you how we do it, and then I'll show you what we do. Does that work for you? Yes. Cool. And I have a few interactive things, so you're gonna you're gonna answer some questions as we go. And I'm good on the screen, right? You can you're see me. Yep. Awesome. Let's see what we. Yeah. There we go. Um, so as a scenic designer, um, we uh, we imagine and plan uh, the visual and physical aspects of how a particular performance will be presented in a particular space. This is kind of what my students start off with in class. This particular statement, and if we break this down. If we break this down, there we go. Um, first of all, a lot of what we do is imagination. We imagine everything we do on stage is something new, something that doesn't exist yet. I have done. I'm in the process. I'm in the process of doing my sixth version of Oklahoma in my career. I've done a lot. I've done a lot of Joseph Me Mason for Dream Code. I've done a lot of Music Man, a lot of Oklahomas, a lot of Greases. Um, so I'm on my sixth Oklahoma right now. I've got some pictures for you. Every time we do it, it's something new. It's, ne it's never the same production, um, different cast, different space, different people. So it's always something new. The cool thing is whatever scenery we create, it, it doesn't exist yet. It's never happened before, and it's going to be very special to that. Um, we also plan. We take our creative thoughts, um, and we... It, it, we just let our imaginations run wild. I teach this to my students too. It's about imagining, it's about researching, it's about creating, putting yourself in the world of that play. Um, the creative phase, the pre-planning, and what you see on stage is literally 10% of what we do. 90% is spent planning and talking. One of the interesting things about theater is that unlike a, kind of a traditional visual artist, um, my, my, my art is based on working with other people. There are other people in the design team. There's a director who's kind of steering the ship, the, the lighting designer, scenic designer, costume designer, props designer, sound designer, and we all have to come together to form a unified vision. So I'm not a, a solo artist. I'm not creating in a vacuum. I'm, I'm working with, with other people to do this. So 90% of it is that communication that happens before. That's hopefully if you see a nice product at the end, communication has, has worked. I have a few, and I won't bore you with the stories. I've had a few not so successful productions <laughs> over the years, but you know, one learns more from failures than successes. Yes. So I don't have any pictures of those. And that's the reason for that. Um, we are, we work in a visual medium. Um, uh, when we look at the set, when we look at the stage, what we try to evoke for our audience um, are these elements. There's an aesthetic element to it. Even if it's even if it's a rundown hotel room on the stage, there should be there should be some aesthetics to it. It should um, it, it it should evoke emotions within the audience. Um, it should help to set the mood of what we're doing. Um, and, and even before the actors come on stage, you you, you capture this feeling just by looking at it. We, we set all of this stuff, we set all of this stuff up. Um, the, other, the other thing we work with is the physical. Um, what does the play need to work in this space? Practical elements, tangible elements. Um, um, those of you who go to a lot of theater, there's a genre called farce, which is that comic genre where it's usually mistaken identity and someone's having an affair with someone else and someone shows up where they shouldn't and there's a lot of doors and they're running into this bedroom and off to that bathroom and, you know, that, that's a farce. And, and the premise of a farce is if everybody actually just spent a minute talking to each other, they would resolve it, but it's more fun to watch them run around for two hours, right? Um, so a, a physical element like that, you need, you need doors, you need, I need bedroom doors, I need bathroom doors. And, this door has to be across the stage from that one because that one there has to be an entrance through that if somebody is exiting through there or the these two bedroom doors need to be next to each other because one actor has to go right in there's always physical elements um, um, to the uh, to, to the show if any of you saw escape thingy which we just did last weekend um, it was set in an escape room and there was there was a door that had to be both functional you had to enter through it, the cast entered through it, the audience all entered through it. And then at the end, it also, the door actually had to, when they, they blew the door up to get out and the, the entire door had to fall down on the stage. So we had a functional door that also had to literally fall out of the frame and hit the floor. Um, takes a bit of doing to do that kind of stuff. So, um, but that, that's those practical elements. So we balance what does the play need with what does the play need to look beautiful and balance that out. Um, particular performance. Talk about every play is one of a kind. 
Like I said, I've done six Oklahomas. Every one of them are different. Every one of them is special in one way or another. I think I'm getting better at it, every, every one I do. I'm learning things. Uh, but, uh, but everything is one of a kind. Theater as an art form is not something you can buy at Walmart or Home Depot. Every set is built, everything is custom made, every costume is custom made. This is the same for high school theater, regional theater, <laughs> college theater, Broadway theater. Um, um, every, every set, every prop is made for that show. Um, and it is it's set in a particular space with that particular designers and directors. So every time we do this, it's unique. Anytime you see a play, think about that. It's, a, it's, a, it's the first time this has ever happened and the last time it will as well for that particular, particular space. And it kind of makes me sad sometimes. I, I love what I do, but you know, I, I walk through the, the museum here and you see all this cool stuff hanging on the walls and it's gonna be there forever, you know? <laughs> My work goes on stage. <laughs> And then it, then it goes in a dumpster, typically. Um, you know, there's something, so there's a bit of a letdown. But on the other hand, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people came to see that. And, and we created a world on stage and we had a great time doing it. And people applauded and, they, and, and the actors felt special about being up there. And people left and they talked about it. And, and years later, they're still talking about, do you remember when they did that show? So my, my work, all of my vision, all my creative energies, literally ended up in a dumpster when it was done but but that moment was so amazing i, I have pictures of it um but but yeah that that's the thing about theater it's it's just it kind of kind of goes away um i shouldn't say that completely we do save some stuff we're good at reusing and recycling and and things but a lot of things just 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 go away so this is my particular space You've all seen this, been over the other side of the campus once or twice, so um, I tried to find a picture of the stage being empty, I couldn't. I was too lazy to walk from my office to actually take one, so um, this is mostly empty. Um, you can, we were actually sorting out doors and platforms that, that day uh, that this was taken, but, but this is my space. Um, um, it's, it's pretty new. I'm, I'm trusting most of you have seen it. It's a wonderful space to work in. I, I was on the planning and design team um, that, that built this space. Um, I can honestly say I know this space better than I know my own house because I didn't build my house, but I was there from literally the pouring of the foundations for this. So, um, so this is our space. And when it's empty, there's, there's kind of a, I know it's kind of a loneliness about it because we're used to seeing stuff on stage and actors and, and scenery. So. Seeing it empty is, is really weird. You don't, you don't get a chance probably to see it empty when you go to see, there's somebody on stage, whether it's a, a theater performance or a music performance, there, there's stuff here. And right, and you're getting ready and the energy is there. So emptiness, is just, it, it's, it's a blank canvas for us. This shot from the balcony makes the stage look really small. It's not, it's, it's, it's really big. Um, but, but from this perspective. Um, so that's my empty space. Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So the first thing we do, the first thing I teach my students is it starts with words. We are working from, um, um, when, we are, when we're doing scenery, we're working from the text of the play. The playwright is very, uh, sometimes very vague. Shakespeare is very vague. There are descriptions in, in, the, in the dialogue. Um, but other plays, actually, we were just talking about Arthur Miller. My, we were discussing Death of a Salesman in my literature and history class. And Miller is very specific. Tennessee Williams very specific about the lighting and the scenery and exactly what it looks like. So we can work from words in the play and the playwrights give us clues. Um, we look at the style of the language that's being used and we translate those words to images. And this is what we put on the stage. We're seeing, we're seeing words as images and wor words creating the world around us. Um, we work in metaphors. So we're gonna do a little exercise. Play, uh, play a little game here. Um, I have a passage from Romeo and Juliet, um, and we're going to create metaphors. To design scene, we create metaphors. So I'm going to show you a couple passages, and we're going to look at metaphors for light and darkness. Um, and if you were in my scene design class, we'd spend more time of talking about the rest. How do they evoke images, and how can we use that to create a design? But I'm going to show you a couple passages, and tell me about the, what we see about light and darkness in here. I'll just let you read them for a minute here. Can you raise them up? Oh, raise um, them up above at level? 
You'd have to change the angle of your projector. I don't know that I can. You should then read it out. Oh, you're going to make me. I am not a Shakespeare. I am a designer, not an actor. But also soon as the all cheering sun should in the furthest east begin to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed, away from the light steals home my heavy son, and private in his chamber pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks far daylight out, and makes himself an artificial night. Black and portentous must this humor prove, unless good counsel may the cause remove. So what do we see in there? What do we have that's talking about light and darkness? Right? Shady curtains. Right? Shady, isn't that a great one? Shady curtains. You can see that in a bed chamber, right? Away from the light. Yeah, away from the light. Light steals home, right? Away from the light. Um, private chamber gives you this illusion that somebody is, somebody is in there. Um, locks far daylight out. We're really going for the gloom here. We're locking the daylight out. We're not letting anything in. Um, making himself an artificial night, right? Really, you know, we're putting up the curtains. Um, so we have a lot black and portentous, right? Not just dark, but black and portentous, right? This is the kind of stuff we look, this, these, this is great words, right? We can do a lot if we're looking for that light and darkness metaphor. <clears throat> The gray-eyed morn smiles on the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light, and fleck darkness like a drunkard reels from four day's path and tightens fiery wheels. Now, ere sun advances burning eye, the day to cheer and night's dank dew to dry. Yeah, how about that one, huh? This is, this is the sun is coming up, right? And it's like, you can say, yeah, the sun's coming up. Or you could say this, right? <laughs> what a great metaphor, you know, for lighting, for scenery that tells us what's happening on stage. It's, it's a gray-eyed morn, right? It's kind of cloudy, right? It's not a, not, not a bright, it's, cloud, it's gray, but it, it's still the morning, right? Eastern clouds, streaks of light in the eastern clouds as the sun is coming up. Flecked darkness, like a drunkard reels. Um, Titan's fiery wheels, right? A reference to the sun coming up. Um, sun advances his burning eye, right? That, that light of the sun coming up over the, over the horizon. Um, and we're bringing on the day to cheer and dry the, the dew from the night, right? So, so, wow, what a way to describe a sunrise, right? So this is the kind of stuff we like. Not, not everybody is as eloquent as Shakespeare at writing you know, <laughs> words like that. But this is the kind of stuff that we look for as visual clues to the world of the play we were going to create. Um, from this, uh, we make choices as to what elements to put on stage. Everything that goes on stage, just like if I'm painting something, if I'm sculpting something, everything in that composition, or if I'm writing a piece of music or writing poetry, every word, every, every syllable, every stro brush stroke, everything on stage is there for a reason. There is nothing on stage by accident. Um, and everything communicates something to the audience. Um, we use... Uh, we use metaphors when creating. I have my students do this. I'll, I'll just read these. So there are metaphors. So, um, something simple. The world is a prison. Business is a game, right? If I'm doing how to succeed in business without really trying, business is a game. That, you know, that creates a metaphor. Maybe the set is a big game board and all the pieces, all the furniture are like playing pieces on there, right? The world is a prison. Actually, I'm going to show you some pictures from Newsies, and that was one of the um, concepts from Newsies, that it was a prison for J New York City is a prison for Jack, a playground for the Newsies. We'll come back to that one. So creating these simple metaphors help to take that visual image and then put, go, uh, put that on stage. We also pull out adjectives, just like we did with Shakespeare. We describe moods, we describe ideas, we describe places. My students, when they're doing projects and when I do projects, I list out all those words and I find adjectives and I pull, pull adjectives out that describe the play and describe the world of the play from the text, typically. And we try to use strong um, words, so like dark, hard, and gloomy. It's okay, but you know what's better? Brutal, labyrinthine, and fractured. <laughs> How about that, right? So this is like, you know, my students would come up with this, and then we brainstorm, well, let's, let's do something better. This I can make a set from. This is cool, this is okay, this gets us there. Brutal, labyrinthine, and fractured, that's, that's what a set's built from. That I can put on stage. 
Um, we also try to keep it positive. And this is uh, another thing. A lot of student designers really go in, it's like edgy and we want to make something dark. And it's like, no, 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 no. We still, at least the, 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 the play might be depressing, but we don't have to like send the audience away just being sad looking at the scenery. <laughs> so the play might be rough, dark, and coarse, but it is not boring, drab, or ugly, right? I can make something look fractured and brutal and rough, but it's not going to be boring. We want to make something that's going to draw the audience's eye in. Um, we're going to get the pictures in a minute, I promise. <laughs> objects have meaning. Everything on stage has a meaning. Um, objects become more than they are in real life. It's, it's not just a chair. I mean, we could put a, put a chair on stage, but it means more when, it on, when it's on stage. It takes on a meaning. It, it fills the world of that play. Um, Everything is selected for a reason, and everything is placed or chosen. Every door, every window, every prop, a set decoration, a particular bouquet of flowers is chosen for the colors. Everything on stage, just like a composition in a painting, is, is chosen for a reason. Um, a simple object becomes something meaningful. A simple coffee cup in an actor's hand. Um, that prop says something about that character of the actor. It's not just a cup we got off the shelf. It's a cup that was chosen to represent that character, um, which gets us into the nature of art. I'm going to digress just for a minute. Something mundane becomes art, right? When it's put on stage. You're familiar with this one, right? Uh, right, this is... Warhol handed these out to all his friends. There's a million of these out there, but you know, this is it's Campbell's soup cans, right? This is that exact thing, what is art? My favorite one, my students always love this. Have you seen this one? Yeah. <laughs> um, simple objects become art. Um, now this is, this is uh, but we're gonna put our art on stage. Um, so uh, objects have meaning. So. The meaning of objects can bring uh, can bring importance as we're designing things on stage. So I'm gonna we're gonna do a little exercise here. What's a door mean? What meanings does it? What what can you think of? What does a door mean? If I have a door on stage, what can that symbolize? You're going in. Right, you're you're going somewhere. You're about to start a journey. You're welcoming in, right? Crossing to someplace new. What what are kind of the the, the opposite? What negative things can we see from a door? Stay out. Stay out, right? Those of you who saw escape thingy, that door shut and you were locked in the escape room. I can't leave now, right? So doors symbolize beginnings of journeys. They can symbolize stuck inside too, right? Windows. What do windows symbolize? Windows are. Uh, um, um, what, what, what do windows symbolize? Light. Right, light, light streams through windows, right? We can see light through it. Um, we, can see, we can see the outside world, right? We can see the world beyond. Conversely, people can see us through windows, yeah. right? Windows can be, can be a lack of privacy if, you, if, you, if they're used in that way. Um, so again, windows have, it's not just a window, it takes on meaning on stage. <coughs> Rocking chair. What's a rocking chair? Comfort. Comfort, right? Home. Um, um, I have. We have a rocking chair in our house. It sits in our living room. There's a blanket over it. My wife sits in it when we watch, when we stream my daughter's uh, basketball games. It was the rocking chair that we used when both the kids were little, and we rocked them to sleep in their rooms. It's the. It's our rocking chair, right? Mm -hmm. And it for us, it, it, it has memories. It has symbols. Right. And if I see that on stage, that's what that. There's there's a comfort to this. There's you know maybe. You know, maybe you have, or, or a parent of yours, grandma or grandpa had a rocking chair, right? And, and there's, a, there's a certain comfort to it too, right? It also kind of suggests something, um, you know, maybe of a, a bygone past, right? Rock, you know, we have lazy boy recliners now. Who needs a wooden yeah. rocking chair, right? <laughs> right? Rocking chairs are also kind of special, right? This is no ordinary chair. This isn't just has legs, it's got rockers on it. This is, these are ornate pieces of furniture, right? The rocking chair was a little bit, you can have all sorts of, regular chairs, but this was special, right? The rocking chairs had a special place, so. authority. Exactly, yes. Ooh. Grandpa sitting in his rocking chair commanding the house. That, that was when I grew up, too. Mirrors. It's a mirror symbol. Well, on stage, technically, mirrors are bad luck. We try to avoid them, but sometimes. <laughs> um, oh, we could do a whole thing on theater super. Have me back next year. We'll do theater superstitions. You'll love this. <laughs> um, what, what do mirrors signify? Reflection, reflecting on reflecting on yourself, reflecting on um, mirrors can also signify vanity, yeah. right? 
or wealth. Yeah, yeah, there's also, you can have different meanings. There's also the whole thing about, you know, the other world through a mirror. I mean, if you really get into, um, you know, psychological stuff or surrealism, um, you know, mirrors have that. There's also a certain, certain wealth to this, right? If you can afford to have a mirror of this magnitude hanging on your wall, you're doing okay, right? So, so there, there's a social status that goes with this. A couple more here. Now, I purposely got some that were kind of run down, but um, stairs can be ascending. I'm going to a better place, right? I'm walking, I'm, I'm climbing the ladder, I'm climbing the stairs, I'm going somewhere. Conversely, you can go down the stairs too, right? Um, you know, they just, just the up or down. Um, Something scary. Something, yeah, definitely these stairs, right? Like, look at this one, it goes up and then it goes, I don't know what's, what's around that corner. There's something up there. Yeah, the suspense thing. Right, the, the Alfred Hitchcock movies and the staircase, right? That's what you're seeing there, right? So, so again, a staircase on stage has, has a meaning. Or a staircase on stage could simply be a vessel to line the Von Trapp children up during Sound of Music when they sing that song at the end. You know, there's that too. Last one here. Ah, oh, oh, right? There's safety, there's warmth, there's the fireplace, there's the hearth, there's a cooking fire, it's the home fire, the fires are lit coming home. But you also have the converse. When Hedda Gobbler takes, um, 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 takes the manuscript and slowly at the end of Act 3 takes it page by page and throws it in the fire, says, I'm burning your child, and burns this manuscript, right? Suddenly this fire takes on a whole different connotation, right? What's that? Hansel. Oh, Hansel and Gretel, yes. We're going to throw it in. Um, one of my favorite, if any of you saw a play that goes wrong a couple of years ago, it was it was a farce. It was supposed to be kind of the slap together set. And I literally took this fireplace and we printed it off and we stuck it on the stage and that was the fire. Um, kind of a little inside joke there. but um, So let's put it all together. Um, it's, oh, thank God, he's got pictures now. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> been waiting for this all morning. Um, so when we start to when we start to work towards a set, um, we take our visual imagery. Before I do a set, I will compile hundreds of images of time period or some pictures show moods and emotions or time period or specific furniture or wallpaper or color patterns at that time or, or design graphic design elements, whatever it will be from the time we're studying. And we put that together and going into a set, we kind of narrow it down to a few pictures that show what's going on. So this is for um, a play called God of Carnage we did a few years ago. It's about two couples that meet in their apartment. Um, their son, their, their boys at school had gotten into a fight and, um, and one of the boys hit the other one with a stick and broke his tooth. And the parents are meeting to figure out what's going to happen. Um, and the, the point of this is it devolved. They come in there all civil, but it devolves into literally car the, They get into a bigger fight than the, than the boys do. Um, and so this is my metaphor. In an austere world of surface crack, in an austere world of surface cracks, civility falters and primal emotion fills the void. Um, and this is my, this is my rendering for the set. We have a floor. We have a simple flower base. It's a very minimalistic set. Uh, they talk about African art in the play. We have some throw pillows and we have a coffee table. And you'll see there's a wall behind. So we have the floor, the couch, the wall. And from this image comes the final set. Um, so this is what was on stage. This actually happened the year coming back from COVID. So all the actors are masked. You see the, um, the other thing, this set was specifically distanced. We don't have close uh, arrangement because we were dealing with COVID protocols at the time. But this is from that, that drawing, you, you see this. You have the crack in the wall behind. It's a very, very simple set. The crack is not just the cracks in civility, but the crack, symbolically, it's the crack in the tooth. This is the kid's tooth back there. Um, so I'll tell you a quick story about this one. This, if you, have any of you seen God of Carnage? Seen the play? OK. Um, I'll tell you the little secret here. Um, one of the actresses at one point has, has to vomit on stage. Um, and. Uh, it come in because she's, she throws up when she gets stressed. And so there's typically a scene where she's sitting on the couch and the others have left and her husband comes up and she's really upset and he kind of rubs her shoulders and he's comforting her. What he's doing while he's rubbing her shoulders is, is he's hooking up the tube from the pump in the couch to the tube that runs down her sleeve. So when she throws up, she can put her hands like this and it just, it, 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 it is horribly funny and revolting all at the same time. Um, 
I've, I've designed three productions of this. I did one. Um, I did the one before this. I did. We actually put it on a rate stage. This was a theater elsewhere. <laughs> And, and we had the added bonus of when she threw up, not only did it get everywhere, but it, it slowly ran down. <laughs> <laughs> it's vegetable soup. It's not real bomb, but it looked really good. <laughs> um, if any of you saw our production of Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, a couple, boy, it just seems like these years go by so fast. This was just this, about this time last spring. What do we value? Um, what human lives take priority over systems of power, property versus humanity, what's important? This was, again, there were hundreds of images collected for this. This was the final kind of, um, um, kind of collage that we did. We had Notre Dame Cathedral, which featured so prominently in, in the story. Um, of course, the window, the bell tower where Quasimodo was up in the bell tower and, and the bell. Can I ask, did anybody see this? You'd be so okay, cool, yeah, good for you. When the bells came in, was that not the coolest thing ever? I love those bells. Giant styrofoam bells. <laughs> but they look just like that. The biggest way was this big, they're huge. Um, and then there's a scene in the dungeon, right? The window coming in, it's dark and shadowy. We had a scene like that uh, where Esmeralda was locked in the dungeon. Um, and there was just a single shaft of light kind of coming in on her. And, um, and then um, and then Frodo, when he sings about hellfire and damnation, and he's, you know, he's a, he's a pious religious man, but he's also seeking power, but he's in love with, the, with, with Esmeralda, but he shouldn't be, and he's torn, and he's singing about the fires of hell, and, you know, and this image of, of hellfire coming around him, just, just so evocative of the show and these, and these big songs. So this is the initial collage, what we put together with that. And then this one, instead of doing pictures, I actually brought you uh, the, the rendering of it. Um, this is actually the, the, the virtual model. Um, we do these all on, this is all done online. And then from this, uh, so this is what the cast sees before the show is built. Um, and then this is what the drawings come from that go to the scene shop and, and what's get, what gets built there. So this is the original rendering for Hunchback. And those of you who saw it, it pretty much looked like this. Um, and then just because we got to make it look nice, there's a, there's a rendering of the light as well. Um, so this is all what you're seeing is all part of, you don't see as an audience member, all of this gets done for every show, all the research, all the images, all the text analysis and character analysis and all of these renderings, because I got to, I got to sell this to the director, right? I got to make this look pretty. So if I light it and it looks really, yeah, I'm going to buy this. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's a bit of being a salesman with this as well. Um, this was for production for Prey Repertory Theater um, last summer of Godspell. Um, and the director wanted an urban look and some urban decay, and we wanted it to start. It was falling apart, and the world was kind of on its, on its last legs, and there was dirt, and there was grime. And we'd pull objects from this, and as the play went on, the world would become better, and people would become happier as we went through this, this journey. Um, if you're not familiar with Godspell, it's a, it's a play. It's, it's, it's basically Jesus and the disciples, and it's kind of the 70s um, pop rock thing. It's, it's not like Jesus Christ Superstar. That's a whole nother, the rock opera thing. This, this is a little more kind of late 60s um, Godspell. Um, but she wanted a very urban setting, and so we chose to do kind of roughly a, a New York City setting. Um, I love the graffiti coming out of this. I mean, just this just looks like, you know, urban, you know, I mean, you have some of that, the building, the storefronts, the windows, the brick. Thing through there. She wanted a tree. She wanted life in the middle of all of this. The tree of life symbolism, right? Trees symbolize growth. They symbolize longevity, um, you know. Um, you know, this tree has been there a long time. There's moss on it, right? This is a picture of Bryant Park. She wanted people playing in a park. The idea that there is kind of urban decay, and then a few blocks away, there's green space and life and that dichotomy. And of course, we can't have New York without our, our subway stations. So from that comes this. We have our green subway station. We actually used one of our trap doors that came up and entered from the subway. It was really cool. Um, I love using our trap doors. We got them. And, and we never had them in donor for years. And now we've got trap doors. We use them all the time. Um, and when you come and see James and John, oh, no, no, I'm not going to show you. are with the trap door when you come and see James and Giant Peach. We have the brickwork back here. 
the tree stumped me for a while. It's like, how do I do a tree? And, and, and then, but I want to do the graffiti. It's like, you know what? I'm going to put the graffiti on the tree. And so it doesn't have to be a real tree. Trees are really hard to do on stage. Making a real tree, there's a lot going on there. So, uh, but just the symbolism of the tree stretching over thing. Um, and then we have, but it's not like negative graffiti. It, it's kind of, it's fun and it's colorful and there's no hate things on there. It's just like, it's just kind of, it's, it's fun and it's colorful and it brings the show together. Um, but you do have the urban care here. You've got the rusty um, staircase going up, multicolored color, you know, multicolored door. And so you've got some fun colors going on, but you still have that very urban feel to it. Right, coming out of that. We talked about this one earlier. New York City, this is the world as a prison. New York City looms over the action, creating a playground for the Newsies, but a prison for Jack. Jack is trapped there, but the Newsies, it's their playground. Pictures of old New York, um, uh, where this is set. This is set in 1899 um, in New York. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is such an iconic thing, because it's set in, in southern Manhattan. The Brooklyn Bridge wasn't even built when Newsies was actually, but, but <laughs> I don't care, and you don't care, and most of you don't realize that, so you know what? I'm going to put the Brooklyn Bridge on stage, and nobody's going to be the wiser. Um, but this, the idea of this ironwork, right? The um, getting into the industrial age of ironwork, the crowded streets of New York. Um, a lot of it takes place in Meta's Theater, so an old theater scene from New York, and Pulitzer's mm -hmm. office over there. Um, so this was kind of the central images that we had. And from that, who saw Newsies? Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you for coming. It was an awesome show, wasn't it? Did anybody see it twice? <laughs> so if you remember the curtain goes up we're at we're at we're on the we're on the rooftop the curtain goes up and we see this right the first rooming house and you see that metalwork here right that kind of industrial age metalwork going on here it's gray it's rusty so you got that urban feel um all those little x's that we think about with that that early machine age um iron work and it's kind of just a neutral color Going to blend in anything. I love the costumes. This too. Billy did a fabulous job with the costumes on this. Um, and they start singing, right? And they hit that big note, and then and they're singing on this. And because we break into song, it's musical. And then the curtain rises, and behind it, I love this moment. Every time we did this, the curtain rises, and we see the full New York skyline back there. We see uh, we see the bridge that matches, and then behind that, we have this kind of very kind of um, um, abstract looking building and city scene, right? It's, it's not any one particular place, but it's just the city behind it. And then looming behind that, remember the word looming? New York City looms over the top. Behind that, we have the Brooklyn Bridge right back there. You don't care that it wasn't built then. It just looks really cool. So you have these scenery layers. You've got, you've got the, these, these, were, these can roll around. These are wagons, and they used them all over the place. Um, and then you had the second layer of the bridge, then it was just layer after layer of scenery. So just as you're going back, colors are getting more and more muted. We're using the same principles we use in fine art, right? We're, we're painting, we're painting depth and things get cloudy in a painting. We do the same thing on stage. Colors get more muted as we go backstage. Things get darker and more shadowy. We create depth on stage. When we were in Donor, we got really good at doing this because the stage was 16 feet deep. <laughs> so we built a lot of scenery in perspective and learned how to create depth from no depth. Now I have significantly more space. I've got about 40 feet of depth. Um, but we still we can still visually create depth with what they're doing. Okay, last couple here. Sneak peek at things that theater yet to come. So I told you about my Oklahoma number six that I'm on right now. So I like the idea of, of light and shadow and the idea of, of wood and this, the, the old barns. This, this kind of stuff fascinates me. A kid growing up in South Dakota. I grew up in, a, in Clear Lake. I, I, I was a town. I grew up in town. All my friends lived out on farms. I'd love to go out to the farm, look at their barns and their haylofts and things. I would help friends. I mean, I did my share of the summers, you know, helping to haul hay bales upstage at friends' house. So I mean, spent a lot of time, you do in South Dakota when you grow up, right? I love this look, these kind of, and there's always like shadows, right? And there's light coming in and, and, and there's usually birds flying around and you can, you can smell that, right? When you're sitting here, you know exactly what's going, that dust, right? And, and I don't even have to make a metaphor for this. You, you know, that's just some, you get the whole picture from that. And the farmhouses that are out there and abandoned and collapsed, right? Um, you know, just, just and, and 
this was, you know, somebody built this. They were homesteading. This was, you know, they probably lived in a, in a sod house and eventually built a house, but they weren't complex structures. They were simple, right? They weren't like ornate with all sorts of stuff. This was, you know, they, they were simple houses and they, 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 they served their purpose. Um, and this was kind of this prairie style of house, right? It, it was simple and it was functional, um, but it wasn't like over the top decorated, right? It was, it, was, it was there and it was nice and it was home. Um, I love this one. In fact, this is what the whole set is based on. And, and because I'm a lighting designer as well, I design scenery thinking about light and look at this, right? I've got my scenery, I've got my walls, but look at that light streaming through, right? So normally Oklahoma is set on this vast prairie and it's, it's pretty traditional. You've got the sky in back, you've got Laurie's house on the side, you've got the windmill, and then the next one you've got the smokehouse, and then Skidmore's goes up. I mean, it's pretty formulaic. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I, I've done five like that, and they were all great. Somebody saw Oklahoma last summer? Yeah. Okay, good. More hands are going up now. If you ask real nice at the end, I'll tell you how we did the clouds. Um, so, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted something different. I like the idea of they're all they're all in this place, and and they're kind of, they're in this world, and and they. Can, they're almost trapped there. The vast expanse of the prairie is there. It's beyond, it's, it's there, but it's kind of out of reach. They're in their home, you know, farmers and ranchers, and they're there. They can't really go far because they have to tend to their cattle, right? That's their home. They're, they're stuck there, but yet you have this prairie expanding. But I, so I wanted the idea of, of this enclosed space, but I wanted Phil to capture the prairie. So um, we have this idea of barn and light streaming through. So uh, this, is, this is the initial sketch. So we essentially have a box set, but it's that barn you just saw, mm -hmm. but there'll be light streaming through all of these, so you'd be able to change the light. Uh, so it's, it's a box set, so it's not the big prairie sky, but, but it's, it's almost like the entire production of Oklahoma is set in a barn. Um, it's kind of, we're doing a play within a play, I've said that's kind of the director's concept. This one is actually going up right now, they're rehearsing it right now um, in Sioux Falls, it'll go in the Orpheum in April um, as part of the premier playhouse season. So Lori's house is very simple, it's a porch that flies in, a rooftop over, we've got our windmill, and, and, that's, you know, and that's kind of it, that set stays um, and uh, the smokehouse would come in. I don't have any of the set dressing in it. This was, again, this was just the initial sketches, the concept sketches, giving to the director. Um, and then the third scene is at Skidmore's, and there's going to be about a hundred little lanterns that fly in over the top to create that barn dance, um, um, big festival event that they're happening. And then the uh, the second half of the second act goes back to Lori's Lori's farm. And then from this, there are other drawings generated. There are work drawings. Uh, but this is just kind of the basic ground plan of it. It's super simple, um, but, uh, but when you see it from the front with all those textures and everything, um, this kind of belies a lot more that's going on. And then I wanted to capture the sky of Oklahoma, so the paint color, which is similar to the paint color we used for our Oklahoma here, if you recall, the, the, the portals were painted in that color. So even though we are in the barn, I wanted to bring the color of the sky. I wanted to bring the sky into that world. So that's that's the that's the paint scheme that we're going to see in that. So this is in April at the Orpheum Premier Playhouse in Sioux Falls. The other one we have going right now is we are doing a production of James and the Giant Peach, um, State oh. University Theater. Uh, the Roll Doll book, if you're familiar with that, this is the stage version. So it's set in the um, the teens and twenties. Um, so it's kind of Edwardian um, because it's a storybook. I wanted to stay away from, from art and do more illustrative art. So I looked at illustrators of the time. Um, so you see, I mean, again, if, if you look up there, you know, Alphonse Mucha, this is art, like Art Deco is here. I mean, that, that's just kind of the quintessential. But, um, you know, Arthur Rackham and Elizabeth Green and, and um, Aubrey Beardsley and Kate Greenaway and all the, all the illustrators from this time were looking at images from children's books and from storybooks. And we wanted to create something that was very illustrative that captured that late 1800s, early 1900s time period. And again, some of these were working a little bit before that, but most audience members, don't know when this, you know, as long as it kind of has, yeah, this is sometime between 1880 and 1920. I don't know when, but, and, and you don't either. And, and that's okay. We're going to put it up on stage. Um, I love this look, the Victorian houses, the old houses. My grandma's house had just this wall of all these pictures on it, right? I love this look. Um, so this play exists in a literary world of past events and imagination viewed through paintings and illustrations hanging on the wall. I want to paint things hanging on the wall. 
So um, I did all the illustrations for this in a very Victorian art style. So I did the initial illustrations. It's my first foray into AI. I ran them through an AI generator to kind of Victorianify them. And I came back. And so, so this would be the image. James grew up in a house by the sea. So we're going to take this image. And what you see when you come into the stage will be a series of picture frames that are hanging up stage. They'll look like that. That's the wall of the picture frame. And as they tell the story in front, the pictures change based on what it is. So that house by the sea um, becomes this on the picture frame. And so these will all be projected. Um, we've done a lot of shows of projections. Um, it's very effective medium. And there's, I mean, I have under the sea images, I've got the ramshackle house on the hill that he went to with his aunts. And we've got, uh, we've got the clouds when the giant peach is lifted by seagulls. And we have the scene where James is out at night and the man gives him the bag of magical dragon or crocodile tongues. And he scatters them on the ground. And the next day, the giant peach has grown there from the tree and that peach will start. And so real simple, the simple illustrative things behind as the action takes place up front and to, to let this, it's a children's show, mostly playing for children. I hope you all come. We're doing evening performances, but using your, I'll, I'll help you with the illustrations, but I want your imaginations to fill in the gaps. At one point, they are roaming around in a giant peach and that is also under construction right now. Oh that looks like that. Um, so more to come on that. That's actually being built as we speak. Um, but that's the giant peach they'll roll around in. Um, speaking of reusing, astute observers will recognize two of the Newsies platforms under the peach here. Um, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and so that, that's actually happening right now. So that's, that's James and the giant peach. So that is what I have for you. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions, or am I at time, or am I going to get the shepherd's crook and haul me off stage here? I think the shepherd's crook, because we had, uh, well, we had the, the technical problems, but you were just fascinating, so we don't mind sitting here. I'm but, sorry. Are we no, 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 okay. no, no, no. No. Okay, one, one quick thing. Okay. So, those of you who saw Oklahoma, we had the clouds upstage, yes? Um, and, and everybody would ask me, how did you do the clouds? And my stock answer was, I could tell you, but what you're imagining is far more interesting than what we actually did. Um, so, no, I'm going to tell you. Um, <laughs> so, on the back of the stage, we stretched deer netting, which is that really fine black mesh that you can wrap around things to yeah. so deer don't your, your plants. Mm -hmm. So, the entire back of the stage was a net of deer netting. And if, if you, once you knew it was there, you could see it, but it's really, really thin and it was lit in front and behind. And then we sprayed adhesive on it and we got bags of polyfill that you use for like quilting or something. Mm -hmm. So, deer netting with polyfill adhesive on it. And then there were a bunch of lights lighting from different directions to make the highlights and shadows. But yeah, basically polyfill on deer netting through those clouds. So the whole thing cost us like about 40 bucks to do that. It was super cheap, it was really effective. Yeah, so that was it. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Um, okay. This doesn't say thank you enough. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Just case in point, I want to, you know, Carrie talked about and Marsha talked about things. When I started here in 1970, mm -hmm. this building was then here, and I made all the costumes for Macbeth oh. in the stagecraft class because you had to put 100 hours in in order yes. to get an A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I made a lot of tunics. We now have to put 42 <laughs> hours in to get an A. 42? 42. We had to put wow. I, I don't even remember who the teacher was. My students would mutiny if I made them do 100 hours. I spent yeah. 90 of those hours in a room in this building wow. sewing by myself. So oh, when I was in stagecraft, um, we our deadline, our uh, we had to be in the dorm by ten o'clock. Yes, and well, so yeah. so we had to so we had to have um, one of the instructors walk us back to the Pearson line so that we could get in. And I was in Matthews, and they still had yeah. those stupid key cards. <laughs> <laughs> this is just just been fascinating. Thank you all. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, we've got a little